Hello, and welcome to Jung at Harp. This is a series of conversations between myself, Deborah Hansen Conan, and Kathleen Wiley about the place where music and Jungian analysis meet. So in this series, we're talking about the seven principles of creative resonance and expression from a project um, that I've created called Strings of Passion. It's a book, it's a class, it's a concert, and it's all about the exploration of creative expression and how to bring it into our lives and what purpose it has in our lives. So today, Kathleen and I are talking about the fourth string in these principles, and that is the string of roles. So I just want to talk just a little bit about what roles are or the way that I see them. And, and I also want to say that for me, um, well, first of all, let me just say, hello, Kathleen. Good morning, Deborah. And how are you? I am doing okay. Yes. Good. Well, I'm really glad to be here once again. And yeah. I'd love to be having this conversation with you. And, you know, I just realized that the context for me of this conversation is really on some level, what is the value or what is the role? Yeah, the value and the role of creativity in our lives and what does it open up to us? And what, um, and I'm also interested in the question of what is passion? What's it like? What does that open up to us? And so all of these strings of passion, which I've identified for myself as the, as the steps or the, not the steps, but the, the principles mm -hmm. that from creative impulse to creative expression. Um, so we're looking at each one of these. And so I just wanted to say that the first string is the string of impulse to do, to be, you know, to touch something, to whatever that impulse is. The second we discussed with a string of structure, how you take that and put it into some kind of structure. The third string we talked about was the string of character, the, the flavor, the mm -hmm. color, the hue, you know, what makes things, bring things, something to life is character. And now we're going to talk about roles. And one of the things I'm, I'm really interested in, in how this plays out in Jungian, you know, in mm -hmm. Jung, because how I've discovered it is, I mean, I think about music as a, as a game especially jazz. So I, I started out writing musical theater, but then I, I went and started playing jazz with a harp and I discovered that there that what made jazz so spontaneous was structure and roles. So the structure that everybody is following the same basic roadmap of a tune, it, it, this is in standard jazz, and, um, and that everyone has a role. So, and, and this is something I had not noticed mm -hmm. from the harp because when I'm playing the harp or the piano, I'm playing all those roles at once. So the roles I discovered were, and let me just shift this down just a little bit. Mm -hmm. The roles I discovered were, and it's really beautifully seen by the harp, is melody, which is up here in the top, accompaniment, which is in the middle, and then bass, which is down at the bottom. And, and in, a, in, in a jazz group, those roles are actually played by people. You know, mm -hmm. there's the bass player, there's the pianist or the, the guitar player who's playing the accompaniment. And there's, this is just in standard jazz. We mush these around, but then, and then there's the horn player who's playing the melody. And when people shift roles, like when the bass player is gonna actually take the role of the melody, it happens at a specific time. It happens when you've hit a specific point in the structure. Mm -hmm. So this structure, and it's and it's very much like a, a, a team sport. You know, so, sorry, I'm not letting you talk. <laughs> That's okay, you go ahead. I'm listening. Okay, good. So in it, I noticed in a team sport, you can once you know how to play baseball and you know what your position is or what the positions are, you can play with anybody in the world. I mm -hmm. I, I can't because I'm not a good baseball player, but you can. You play your position, you know the guidelines of the game, so you get out there and you play and you can be spontaneous. So the roles actually, the roles and the structure of the game actually give you the, you know, the parameters to be totally spontaneous, to bring your personality, to bring who you are. Mm -hmm. So that's the first way that I sort of started observing roles. And then when I started writing for symphony orchestra, I realized that there were families in the orchestra. There's a string family, there's the woodwind family. And in each family, it was the score was literally set up with the melody instruments on the top or the highest instruments on the top, the instruments that played accompaniment in the middle of the staff, and then the instruments that play bass down at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, this is so visual. It doesn't mean they can't shift around or you can't play with them, but that's sort of um, how, uh, that's sort of characteristic of them. 
And then the second thing about roles that I really became very clear to me through music was the roles of leadership and followership. And that became very clear to me <clears throat> when my <laughs> player boyfriend said to me, when I, he was first teaching me how to play jazz, he was like, the first thing you need to know is the bass player's always right, even when he's wrong. And what he meant was, you got to have somebody in the role of leadership. Mm -hmm. Whether they're right or wrong, you need to know who to follow. Then you can work together. And, um, and then when I started playing with, when I started writing for symphony orchestra, and I tried to put jazz, a jazz group together with a symphony orchestra, I realized, oh my gosh, the jazz players are listening to the drummer and the bass player to get the beat and know where they are. The symphony players are looking to the conductor. They're using their eyes. That's where the beat is. And that's where, you know, that's where they know they are. And these two things were not linking up. And it was just so immediately obvious. And so I started realizing, oh, leadership and followership can happen in different ways. Mm -hmm. And how we follow makes a huge difference in how effective leadership is. Mm -hmm. So those are the ways that I've been looking at roles. It's, the, it's the, the, you know, the role that you have and how it allows you to be spontaneous and the roles of leadership and followership. Mm -hmm. So take it away. <laughs> what are your <laughs> thoughts on that? You know, as I'm listening to you talk about the bass, the melody, and the accompaniment, or bass, accompaniment, melody, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about Jung's model of the psyche, which says that there are three primary layers. There is the collective unconscious, there's personal unconscious, and then there's our conscious mind. So I'm sitting here as we're talking, thinking, okay, the collective unconscious is like the base. It's the leader. It's in charge because it is out of that largesse that the foundation of our soul comes, that this, the essence we are comes. Wow. And that's the leader. And then the personal unconscious is like the melody. It's like what gets activated in our own nature and sometimes becomes what people call personality. But it's more than that. So the personal unconscious becomes like the accompaniment. That's always going on in the background. Sorry, I said um, melody, but the personal unconscious like the accompaniment. And then the melody is like the consciousness. It's what we choose to do. And within the conscious mind, there is our sense of self-ego. And then there are also the, our persona or the various roles we assume. So that, you know, we can put on different faces. I think that's one way I think about roles is like putting a, a mask on. So, you know, when people get dressed up at Halloween or people who put on their Christmas costumes or whatever this year, you know, yeah. you know, you put on a mask, you put on certain garments and it helps you access the feeling and the mental state and the emotional state of that character, that role. Right. Yeah. I, I was going to ask about, because I, I'm also seeing that role and character, there, there's, there's something very um, connected, connected about that. Yeah. Very connected. Yeah. So in a way, the other thing I was thinking is that from a point of Jungian psychology, when we work with people in analysis, then we're looking at the symphony orchestra and jazz quartet that lives within them. So that the other thing you can think about is that within our own nature, we have the bass player, we have the accompanist, and we have the, um, you know, the melody. And, and I suppose, depending on what instrument you play, what, where that might fall, but we all have that. And we do to make a harmonious sound, to live peacefully, to live joyfully, to move in the flow, we want all three of those parts of our nature working together versus being at odds with one another. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Right. And it's so, it's so interesting because as you're talking about that, I'm thinking so many things. I'm thinking about cacophony and, and how I love it sometimes. Mm -hmm. I really love that. Just like, and so there's, there's, there's harmony where you're, well, there's mo I, monody, I think it's called, or unison, where you're singing the same thing with someone, which is a beautiful thing. It's just like right. both singing the same. There's harmony when you're singing something that harmonizes with someone else. There's poly, 
sort of polytonality. Like if you've ever heard Charles Ives, there's like one thing that's going on and then another thing that's going on. It's very clear that each thing is happening, mm -hmm. but it's how they're interacting that is part of what gives you this, well, for me, this amazing, beautiful sense of imbalance and, 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 and the unexpected. And then there's cacophony where there's no, theoretically no structure. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of composers play with how you, you know, how you could bring any of those sounds in. Be, oh, because there's also um, what I, I think was called aleatoric music, which is when there's chance, chance, you know, some chance sound, and then you can choose what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm kind of going off on a, on a um, tangent here, but I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about how you follow things and then the other thing that I thought about when you were saying this, and maybe I had too much coffee this morning, I don't know, anyway, um, was I had an experience once when um, I, I, my teacher, my harp teacher, mm -hmm. um, went out of town and two of her students, me and Natalie, were house sitting for her. And we were like, oh, what are we gonna do? Our teacher's gone. And I said, I have an idea. Let's each give each other a lesson and pretend that we're Linda. Mm -hmm. She was like, okay. And so um, I said, I'll go first. You, you teach me. And when, um, and so I, it was amazing as she started being Linda, she started saying things that were very Linda. I mean, it, I mean, but so that was beautiful. And then when I took the role of Linda, our teacher, it's like something came over me and I began to speak and see and, and observe mm -hmm. and know differently. Mm -hmm. What is that? Well, I would say it a little bit differently that instead of something coming over you, something came up from your personal unconscious that you had internalized and, imprint, and had imprinted on your psyche with all of your lessons with Linda and all of the time you spent with her. And this is a primary thing that shapes all of us from birth is the outer world interactions that we have with other people imprint themselves on our psyche. It's, there is a way where uh, a Linda lived inside of you vis-a-vis -vis all the lessons and she lived inside of your friend, Natalie. So you both all of a sudden, when you put yourself in the mind to be like, Lin be Linda, you could access it because it had been internalized. It's like the, in the experiencing of it, you took it in and it became a part of you. Oh, I got it. So it became a part of me. And then when I decided to embody it. Right. I, yeah. It's like when you said, okay, I want to be like Linda. It was like you called it forth. It's like you opened up the door to access it. Whereas perhaps at other times when you were sitting at your heart thinking, oh, Linda told me to do this, it was imposed from the head versus saying, okay, I'm going to be like Linda and opening the door to access what was already in you. So you're saying I'm, so, so it seems like the, the, the functional thing here is I'm going to be Linda versus I'm going to do what Linda told me to do. Right. Or be like her. I think it's okay. more accurate. Or I sometimes, you know, in, in terms of characters that live in our psyche, I'll say it's like, we're going to access that. It's like, you can think of, of, and you've got these beautiful flowers behind you today with all the various petals. Right. So you can think of all of the characters or roles that we play like petals of the flower. So there's a petal of the flower that's your jazz boyfriend, um, your formal boyfriend who taught you about jazz. There's a petal of the flower that is your heart teacher, Linda. I'm sure there's a petal of the flower that's, you know, your mother and what she gave you musically. So it's like accessing that petal of the flower. And so when you move into that petal of the flower, you feel the essence of it. You have the scent, you have the, and they're all similar and they're all connected to the stem that is you that is your psyche, but they each are a little bit different. I see, so, so, oh wow. It's like we come into the world as something that is going to bloom, but we actually bloom to, to others or, or we bloom others within us. 
We right. And what neuroscience and developmental psychology is showing now is that there's a lot of interactive social skills and um, emotional relating that seem to be inherent within our central nervous system when we're born. But unless we have experiences in the outside world with other people when we're young to activate those circuits or to call them forth, then they don't get activated. They stay dormant. So it's kind of like the petals that are, are called forth. You might think of it that way. Right. So that's bringing me to two things I want to ask. Uh -huh. about. How do we actively activate some things that we want to? And in my relationship with my mother, unlike I'm sure anyone else, <laughs> but, you know, was both marvelous, beautiful, wonderful. Uh -huh. And there was, there was real you know, trauma there. Uh -huh. And I see that I unwittingly, live the trauma or the fear from the trauma right so how so i'm assuming that's part of what analysis is about is to find those unwitting mm -hmm. things that we're doing and then and i'm assuming that it's also part of it is being to, able to activate the parts that haven't been that we want mm -hmm. to that's right it's both and so what happens in trauma and an image that I really like is if we took that flower with all of the petals connected to the stem and all of a sudden some of the petals got disconnected and started floating around, then you couldn't access them when you were in your center, your stem, because they're floating around disconnected. So what happens is when we experience traumas, often we have emotional body experiences that get split off. So all of a sudden something happens and we get pulled into that feeling state, but we're disconnected from our center, like the stem of the flower. So we can't access anything. We're caught in it. We're unwittingly living it. Oh, so we actually, we actually separate along with that. That's right. That's what dissociation is. And so part of the work of the good enough analysis or good enough therapy is providing a container of the relationship with the analyst and the analysand, the client, where not only is the stem with all of the petals that are connected help, but this dissociated bit is help because the analyst therapist isn't dissociated. And so by holding that, then together, the client and the analyst can begin to see that bit, experience it, so it comes back and takes its place connected to the stem. And once it's connected to the whole of you, when it comes up, it's totally different because you have access to the other 30 petals on your flower. You know, it's like you can say, oh, there's that thing, but I don't have to live there. I can live here. But we stay stuck repeating it as long as it's dissociated. And people, when people want to get rid of feelings, when they want to get rid of memories, when they try to shut the door and pretend it's not there, all that does is further the fact you're going to get stuck in it. So when they're, when it's isolated and we're isolated in it, we're, is, then we're isolated. isolated. I see. And when we are held in the room with it, it can it can begin to integrate. It like begins to take its rightful place, which then means it, it loses its power. I mean, when you've got 30 parts of yourself to draw on instead of being caught in one, right. <laughs> then you have options. Then you, you, you can make choices. So when it's caught, it, it almost seems like it's caught in fear, uh, fear and isolation or, or aloneness. Well, clearly those things are all characteristics of it. Uh -huh. A definition of part, a part of what, a definition of what makes something a trauma is that someone has an experience, a bodily based felt experience, um, and they're not able to make sense of it. It happens to them so young in life, they're not able to make sense of it, and there's no one there helping them make sense of it. So it's kind of like getting caught in a part of yourself. I call it a crazy bit. <laughs> you know, we all have crazy bits, you uh -huh. know. Sometimes um, with my husband now, seven years, um, there are some things we have very different ways of being. And finally, I just got it about some things. If I just said, you know what, 
I know it doesn't make any sense to you, but it just makes me crazy. When, when you do that, it just makes me crazy. And you know what? He got it because we all have that. So it, it's kind of that place where we really can't do anything. And sometimes with consciousness, we see it and we know we're in it. But as you're talking about it, I, I get this imp impression of being in a maze. And just being like at one of those places where the maze doesn't go anywhere but like like i just can't even turn like what i don't like i don't even think to turn around there, there is no possibility of that right that's right so as you're talking i can't help but think uh, I, i'm thinking about music mm -hmm. and um how we might actually use music I mean, I know a therapist in, in, in analysis, the therapist is holding, you said is holding. <laughs> so is there any way to use music in a way to hold ourselves? Oh, so, absolutely. So how I mean, do you do that? Well, I mean, there's a whole discipline of music therapy and some of the major hospitals around the country have music therapy programs and music therapy departments where musicians go in and play in the surgical ICU or in um, the ER or the, or, or the OR recovery. Right. So there's a whole branch of uh, musical medicine now, right, if we want right. to call it that. Um, and I think a lot of musicians that I've met, music was the way that they found to hold their self together from childhood. You know, we all find our way. Uh, right. Right. every man's theory is a self-confession everything we do is really a, <laughs> it, it really puts every all of who, what we are on the table <laughs> every man's what every man's theory every man's theory is a self-confession so our life you know we all make the choices we make because it's it's how our psyche soul finds its way to live and stay alive you know so and and then that can be okay. I uh, and so music definitely does that. To answer your question, yeah, well, I'm, well, you talked about examples of someone else playing music, mm -hmm. and you know, you know, like I'm all about everybody playing music. You know, like that 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 doing and it, part of it is like well, I want to do it myself. You know, give me the instrument, mm -hmm. let me play it. Um, and there's and I'm, and I'm learning that there are as I have other people perform my music and I see that that is that is a whole other experience for me uh, that where it that gives me a greater experience of myself mm -hmm. and and that, so that's beautiful having other people play music that makes us feel like we're greater or we're connected and I was just thinking like if people had an instrument whether it's a harp or whether it's a piano or whether it's a string or a harmonica or whatever is there something that we could do just to, and i know this is probably way out of the purview but i just, <coughs> is there a way to like literally like i was working with a guy yesterday to develop this idea about harp yoga uh -huh. how we could like do yoga and then like literally you know like use the harp um as part of the yoga pose and i'm just thinking is there anything like let's say i wanted to do a meditation where i wanted to connect that i don't know i'm just i'm just thinking out loud mm -hmm. it, it, like what is there a way i could do something that was so simple on the instrument so simple that it would take no technical um concern and that might that use help me put myself in the in the room in the well, you know children naturally do this all you have to do is go into a room of three-year-olds kinder music where uh -huh. they all have been given instruments and they're naturally doing something that feels good to them and that sounds good to them and they haven't yet had those filters oh that's not music oh that's not the right note for that chord oh you know they haven't had that put on them right. so so I believe we're naturally born and do that. And we see that when, again, kinder music, it's a program where we can see that you give, you give a room of three-year-old musical instruments and there's going to be music. There's, it may be the cacophony you mentioned earlier, you know, and then the adults say, oh, no, 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 you have to do it here. You have to do it there. And in a way, what that does is squelches the very thing you're talking about, which is how do we just come to the instrument and as adults and as harpists, how do we go to the heart, yeah. whatever mood we're in, and let ourselves do whatever feels right? Maybe it's one note. 
Right, and just experimenting. And, and then, experimenting. And that, that is one of the things that I have tried to set up in, in the strings of passion in the mm -hmm. class. Um, it, the part of it that's for harpists or musicians, set up these soundscapes that kind of hold the background yes. that allow people to just play a single note and hear it in context. Yes. So that we are not trying to, you know, oh, that's, that's, that's just a note, it's nothing. Right. When you can experience that, that note is everything right now and then what that opens up to us. Yes. And it seems to happen through a combination of playing and listening. And one other thing, and I, and I don't, it's, it's almost like visioning into it. I want to say being it. Okay. Because it's a being instead of a doing. If I sit down at my heart and I, let's just play up and say, I'm going to do a one, four, five pattern. Uh-huh. And I do that being with it and really experiencing it. That's one thing. If I do it, that's another. And, and the being you're listening. And let me, let me just do that for a minute. Yeah, do that. And have you, um, this, I'm just setting up for anybody who's um, yeah. not a harpist, not a musician. <laughs> I'm putting my harp into the key of C. Um, so, um, so I'm going to play a, what's called the 1-4-5 pattern, which means I'm just building a chord on this, this C. I'm going to choose that as 1, and then 1, 2, 3, 4 is the next chord, and then 5. And so I'm just going to build a pattern. So I just played a 1-4-5 pattern. Um, it could be... It could be I mean, that's also a one, four, five. Mm -hmm. It feels completely different. Okay, so what, what if you were to direct me? Like, um, okay, I do that. And what might I... Okay, so, so for a minute, let's start out with the, the negative. Okay, good. Think of one of the most horrifying experiences you ever did on stage and then play one, four, five. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now I want you to shake it off. Okay. <laughs> Literally shake it off. You know, when animals f fall down or roll over, they, sh they boink, they shake it off. Oh, yeah. They oh, the dogs do that. Just get yes, dogs do it. it. So shake it off. Right. And now I want you to really go to that place inside that's your center where okay. you know the beauty of who you are. And you know that when you live from that and your heart emanates, that what, what needs to happen happens. And then play one, four, five. I'm having a little trouble with that, but I'm thinking, I'm just going to go, how about if I just go to experience that I loved when I loved Okay, music. that works. Okay, all right, so. So what did you observe that was different? Wow, I, I was definitely in those experiences. Like the ex second, ex uh, the second experience was when I discovered um, a room where my dad worked that was down in the basement. He worked in this castle for a while it was this weird castle people had built and in the basement had been the children's room and it was all covered in tile and but it was a big room and if you and if you sang you could hear your echo so much you could harmonize with yourself oh wow and it was just this magical place and i i i wow. took my brother there one day and we just sat there and just sang mm -hmm. hmm. how beautiful yeah. yeah, yeah. So what did I, 
um, well, it never occurred to me to actually spend some time each day just collecting those experiences yeah. in my apron, you know, to carry around with me. Yeah, and, and you mentioned passion at the beginning. See, now we're right. talking about finding your passion because it doesn't come from outside. It doesn't come from trying to assume someone else's role or an archetype, but it comes from within you and those experiences you already know deeply. And, you know, there may be a, to, to, to access the magic and that sense of opening or to access that sense of stuckness and, and jerkiness when needed to convey that, that emotion, it all is already inside of you. I see. So, so actually giving it a voice. Giving it a voice. And that's one of the big things I discovered in, in working with the strings of passion. At first, I just thought, oh, this is, um, you know, I'm breaking down the principles of creative expression so I can understand it. But then I began to understand that it, it wasn't just about creative expression. It was about creative resonance mm -hmm. and in my whole life. And that how I was, I began to experience that there was almost like what a harp the mirror image of a harp inside of me that I was playing in the same, as I played my harp on the outside, so was it played on the inside. As it was played on the inside, so was it played on the outside. Mm -hmm. And then I began to realize, oh, it's not just my harp, it's everything. Yeah. I have that same with a spoon, right. creative resonance. There's a spoon on the inside. Everything is, is mirrored and I can either have that resonance mm -hmm. between them where there's a truth between them or I can have an untruth between them. Right. Yeah. And, and part of what I'm thinking about is we've all, uh, we've all seen performers, musicians, uh, as well as a variety of other people are presenters, you know, lecturers, teachers uh -huh. who, when they stand up, you can just, it, it's all polished and it's just right. Right. But you can tell it's the persona they've put on. Right. It's the role they've stepped into. Right. And then there are other musician performers or presenters we've seen where there is something that's polished, but it isn't that rehearsed, every move is staged, every inflection stage, but there's a polishing that's got a rawness in the moment of what is coming into expression in that moment. Wow, right. So we see it happening. We don't see right. oh, it's my thing. But we right. like it's like looking in a in an oven and actually seeing the cake, right. you know. Right. And so those are two very different kinds of experiences for the audience as well as for the musician, performer, or presenter. Yeah, and I will say that I, I, so I grew up with music in my home and mm -hmm. performances, almost like secret performances, but like big secret performances. Like, mm -hmm. you know, my mother would put on the, the soundtrack for an opera and then beat the opera. And it was so, um, so dramatic and beautiful. And then I would go to a concert hall and I would sit there and I'd be like, what? Mm -hmm. I don't get it. I, I don't get it. Yeah. And I don't. And, and then I started noticing when I started teaching mm -hmm. that I would, as I would coach students, they would do something even with la total quote lack of skills that they might experience. I would see something real and it was just so beautiful. And I was yes. like, that's what I want to see. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it comes from a different place. It rises up and out versus being imposed from within and out. Right. Yes. Yeah, so and we talked about that when we talked about structure, that the, the greatest structure is that. So I was, as I was looking at the definition of, of um, passion today, I was mm -hmm. looking at, um, you know, what, you know, it, it's, it's like desire. And you talked about yearning in a, in a couple other sessions. Yes. It, it seems like it's like passion. It doesn't have to be loud and bombastic. It can be very quiet. It, it feels like it's an ember and an ember that's there regardless. It can, it can be, it can mm -hmm. become a flame. It's there and it's, um, 
oh, 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 and it's yearning, but also knowing um, and also wanting to do something. There's some action involved in it. That's how I experience passion. Mm -hmm. It's not just, oh, I'm listening and that's beautiful. Right. It's, I'm, there's something there. Yeah, there's an energy. I mean, we might think of that passion is a quantity of energy uh -huh. that draws us towards something that we want to express or that we want to have, we want to experience somehow. So that, that inherent in it is a, is a prompt to action. Right. And it's almost as if we often sometimes discover the thing if we just follow that prompt to action. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, that's a basic principle of Jungian psychology. It's following one's own libido, following one's own innate life force. If you follow your own yearnings and desires and passions and learning to listen, as you mentioned with music, learning to listen to know the bass, <laughs> learning to listen to know the voice of the larger self or soul that we are so that we can follow that voice instead of the internalized shoulds, must, and ought tos. <laughs> they get oh, it all. Wow. So it's almost like, I, I just realized it's almost like the shoulds, must, and ought, whatever you would just say. Right. I suddenly, and you said that, I was like, oh, well, that's like going and, and buying fast food. That's <laughs> yeah. the fast food that we try to have instead of the... The substantial. Right. Nursing. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to the word libido because I think it's been really misunderstood. I'm assu I'm, I think I've misunderstood it. Um, so we've of often heard about libido. We think of it as sexual right. desire, but you're describing it as the 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 life force. So, so this is a basic point um, where Jung and Freud broke. Um, Freud believed that all libido was sexual in nature, and any other expression was sublimated. Jung did not agree with that. He believed that the libido was the life force, much more akin to the Eastern thought, if anyone's familiar with Eastern and traditional Chinese. Anyone, anyone in this room? Yeah, the chi. <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> or anyone listening. <laughs> um, so the life force, and the life force, Jung says, takes expression in many different forms, sexuality being only one. And I think in one of the other, um, of one of our other talks, I referenced the five instinctive factors of hunger, sexuality, um, movement, self-reflection, and creativity. So that's a good way. Jung says the libido flows in all five of those areas. You know, and again, as we said before, the hunger is not just literal physical hunger, uh -huh. but it's the hunger, the yearning for touch, the yearning for love. The longing to have a place, you know, the sexuality being a desire for union sexually, but also a desire for connection, you know, a desire for, um, you know, having clothes where one feels like they're an expression of oneself. Mm -hmm. There's a unity in that, you know. So if there's a life energy, like I know in the, in the, I think the Jewish tradition, there's uh, Yatsa Hara, Yatsa Tov, you know, there's the life energy, there's the death energy. There's a death energy. Mm -hmm. Is there also a death energy in the Jungian sort of? Well, Jung says everything exists with its opposite. So if there's an instinct to life, there's also an instinct to death. And I think of it um, in terms of the tree of life, which is a major glyph from um, the Jewish teachings of the Kabbalah, mm -hmm. that says there are three primary forces always at work. There's the force of creation or, or force, then there's the, the energy of equilibrium, and then there's the energy of destruction. And that for anything to come into manifestation, it undergoes all three. So then again, you said, what were they again? It was uh, creation. creation? equilibrium and oh. destruction yeah that's yeah. really interesting i mean it's, it's the basic christian myth of birth death and resurrection it is the whole easter story you know things come into being they're born mm -hmm. and then something dies and then mm -hmm. something's born again and that's the equilibrium and and the equilibrium is the middle place i always say the equilibrium is the pause that refreshes <laughs> Thinking like our lives <laughs> well it's that moment you know i i think you know it's like a pendulum so you know there are those moments you know uh, you may, if you're lucky if i'm lucky i get maybe 30 minutes of it and then i'm on to the next you know? but well, in life in life and death would that be 
life, uh, no, so birth, equilibrium, death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we are now, theoretically, if this is real, um, in equilibrium. Well, actually, I think they're all three going on simultaneously all the time. I think it's much more of a holographic process. So while I'm talking, something's being created, then you start responding and I may have a momentary equilibrium, but then something's being destroyed in order to make room for the new thought that's being created. It's a, it's like ongoing constantly. It, it happens. You're playing music. You play one thing and you listen and you're imagining you're going to the next place, but all of a sudden that's destroyed and something's news recreate created in response to your listening. And it's, it's automatic. It's oh, like, I think I'm going here, but when I listen, right. I realize that in fact, it is going there. And yeah. I, I talk to students about this and myself about in, in practice, which is another string about the practice. We can practice to get something like, Hey, I'm going to get this. I'm going to practice. Or we have a practice to let it get to us. Yeah. Yes. And it sounds like we can at any moment have intention. I'm going to go, Oh, wait. Oh, oh now yeah. I have an, Oh, um, so does that make us like, blah, blah, like, <laughs> or, well, I think about it. I mean, we can, it goes on in our bodies with digestion. And, you know, when you're building muscles, you know, there's, and there's, I forget all the metabolic terms, but anabolism, catabolism, you know, we eat food, it gets torn down, you know, and then it gets what can gets integrated and then what needs to get excreted, you know, to build a muscle, you tear the muscle down, then the muscle builds back up. These processes go on all the time, both physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, as best I can tell. And they're organic. It's not like we have to think about it. What we can do with consciousness is recognize where it's happening. And then for instance, with that split off bit of trauma, when you realize that's happening, you can begin to use an understanding of the life cycle of creation, equilibrium, destruction to help destroy the dissociation to bring it back in to integrate. So with con it's like the currents of the river. We learn how to row. If you know the, you can't control the rapids, but if you know where the rapids are, then you can get prepared and you can strengthen your muscle to navigate. So, so you said something just now. You said. Um, destroy the disconnect. Yeah. Like, something like yeah. that. So just, can you talk a little bit more about that? You, so you're, 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 you're this flower and, and your petals are, you know, your experience and your interaction, who you are, you know, with, right. and how it's bloomed through your experiences with other people. And then a trauma happens and the flower and the, one of the petals gets dissociated and then you're out there with it. Right. Or at least part of you is out there with it. Right. And, and, and you said, you, you know, when you, or I think you said, when you realize that you can use something, you can use this understanding of birth, death, or the life, death, and equilibrium to actually bring that back in. How would you do that? What would that look like? Um, for me, again, it's that primary thing of relating to it people don't relate to their traumas because they're afraid they're going to get stuck there because they don't understand that there is an organic process that's going to work on their behalf that when they can stay in the whole of who they are and relate that this organic process is going to pull it back in and integrate it now what does relate mean it means being willing to tolerate the presence of it which would mean feeling it which would mean having a mental understanding of it, which would mean keeping oneself grounded in the current reality. So it's like having one foot in the current reality of now, while the other foot is over in the reality of the past. So you know? let, me, let me give you an example. So I had, um, um, I realized last night in a relationship with a friend that we, they were, we were both afraid of going into a, um, into a, to do a project together. Um, and she, she was afraid that I was gonna, um, you know, be like too creative and, and that would be hard. And I was afraid that I was going to do something that might undermine her, you know, her. And, and, but when she actually mentioned that I got very triggered. And mm -hmm. when I went back to start thinking about it, I realized 
I think what I realized is that there's a lot in here uh, that I have this something kind of fear that like I just by being alive and being who I am, I destroyed my mother's ability to launch her own career. Mm -hmm. And I, I certainly had not realized I was walking around with this. Mm -hmm. Now, how might I access that? I mean, knowing it is just knowing it. That's like, oh, I know that. That's not accessing it and relating to it, right? Well, I think that you accessed it in the moment you were triggered. Uh, I mean, the access, this is the problem, you see. We, right. it, <laughs> the, the access, accessing it means experiencing it. And, and, you know, it means feeling it. And you were feeling it when you were triggered by your friend's comment. Right. And, you know, what you're also talking about, I want to say, the bioenergetic people, um, Lowen and Paracas talk about, is um, because sometimes early in life we have these experiences and things get internalized, that a child can end up with a deep core, deep down inside feeling like they don't even have a right to exist. You don't have a right to exist. You don't have a right to create. You don't have a right to have a voice. And these are really deep, deep seated things. Nobody thinks that. Nobody really would say, oh, I believe that. Right. But on an energetic feeling level, it comes up and blocks. And that's what you're experiencing. Right. And then we act. As and you act according. You act like it's the truth. Right. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and so that I would say is a pedal I just saw. Last yeah. month there. Now, obviously, you're an analyst. I mean, the, people, <laughs> they don't come to you and say, okay, Kathleen, how do I fix this? And I'll go over and I'll just do that. So I'm assuming that that, you know, that's, how would that be, um, well, how, how would you access that in music? How would you access that in, in anal analysis? So when I say sometimes people do ask me and I always say to them, if I had the one, two, three answer, I wouldn't be in the office. I'd be on Oprah. <laughs> but, but what I would say is it's um, that you've already started by doing exactly what you did when you got triggered. You got triggered and you started saying to yourself, what is going on here and what's this about? Mm -hmm. And in doing that, you begin to be with the feeling and the body state that was triggered and you begin to track it back to this experience or this kind of cumulative sense of your life with your mother. Mm -hmm. And when you said that, I just felt such sadness and compassion for you. Mm -hmm. That's where the healing happens is when we can get to that place of sadness for ourselves and the other for your mother too, because you know, being a mother does change things for all. I mean, you know, and, um, and so to be able to be sad for what that has done to you and sad perhaps for what it did to for her being a mother. Yeah, and as you're talking, I'm thinking, this is interesting, because uh, we started talking about roles, which is what mm -hmm. we're talking about today, and now we're talking about roles in a very different way. Yeah. We're talking about, um, you know, the child role and the mother role, and, you know, what might happen, or the parent role. Right. Happen, either one. And, and these are roles, so in the beginning, I was talking about roles of connection, mm -hmm. and now we're actually talking about disconnect. Well, not necessarily. Okay. What we're talking about is her creative energy went a different place. Instead of her creative energy perhaps going as fully into launching a professional career, some of that creative energy went into raising and parenting you and raising and parenting your brother. And I don't know if there were others. No. So it went a different place. It's not that it got, she got disconnected from it, but the form that it took the expression that it took changed. So if she were alive today, how could she? So I'm thinking that many people are, are, are thinking, oh, that happened to me. You know, I, mm -hmm. my energy, my intention was this, my passion was this, and I got sidetracked. Mm -hmm. I put my passion into something else. Um, and, and I'm not at peace with it. I, I'm not, mm -hmm. it's not and, and therefore it's not actually giving me the energy that I need. I feel like it's taking my energy. Um, I love this moment. I feel like I'm, I don't know where we're going. I'm scared. And, and, and I love it because I feel like I'm lost 
and and so I know we're going to go someplace that's going to be fun. Um, what do we do when we and what can we do if we don't even experience this yet? I mean, I had this moment last night, so I got to see like, mm -hmm. oh my, as I started looking at, so it, at first it was just an altercation, but then mm -hmm. as I started taking it apart, I was like, oh my God, this, oh. Yeah. And as I started putting words to it, I, that's when I saw it. Well, you know, I said my response to you when you shared that was both sadness and mm -hmm. compassion. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be willing to get to the place of sadness. And then we have to be able to bring compassion, compassion to ourselves compassion to another the power of compassion or loving kindness which to me are the same thing is is inordinate i mean tehar dushadan the um, mystic says you know when we can harness the power of love we're going to have something so much more powerful than the splitting of the atom but we've yet to harness that so to bring compassion to oneself to you and that this has been your experience compassion to your mother compassion perhaps to your friend who in the moment was like your mother right. uh, yeah. um and i have a funny feeling i was also being like her mother yeah yeah, yeah yeah probably so this is how these things come up for healing and i think and 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 being willing to feel the sadness and then moving toward compassion and cultivating that because you know compassion doesn't automatically come sometimes it's right. something we have to work to cultivate. Um, and, and I just want to put a plug in for Eric Fromm's book, The Art of Loving. It's an old book. He was a psychoanalyst, Freudian analyst who furthered Freud's work, but he wrote a wonderful book called The Art of Loving. Mm -hmm. And he talks about cultivating love and how do we cultivate love and, you know, the arms of acknowledgement, recognition, validation, acceptance, care and concern. Oh. It's a great book. Yeah, but, I've, I've heard of it. That's great. Yeah. I it. So for if we, you know, when we think, well, okay, well, what is compassion and how do I do that? Right. I think Prom's book is a great, great read. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking, because I'm always asking, where does music fit here? Where does music fit? Mm -hmm. And I think it fits in the sadness part. And mm -hmm. I know that, that, I know my teacher, Tony, used to always say, we, we need to become victims of our own work by which he meant we need to be able to make ourselves cry. We need to be able mm -hmm. to make ourselves laugh. And, um, and I think that for me, I could, I could court that sadness by taking something very simple that I could repeat over and over again, mm -hmm. like that room that had its own resonance. And even if I was, I mean, I, I could, I'm sure I could make myself cry right here in this moment by singing, you know, what my mother used to sing, yeah. which would be like, oh, my baby. I mean, I'm close to tears now, and I'm, I'm imagining that if I gave myself the time to sit and do that, that I could get to that place. Mm -hmm. So that, and you, and you were saying that, that there's these two things, there's to be able to feel the feelings mm -hmm. and then to have the compassion. Yeah. I mean, clearly the music and the various modes that you talk about access mm -hmm. different emotional states. Right. So working with that for expression can help. The other thing I want to say, the third thing I, I, after we are willing to, to feel the sadness and then compassion is then also really claiming the bit of self that did get lived because your mother did live her, her creativity perhaps it isn't as she initially imagined oh. and she had some regret, but she, she lived her creativity. And I hope for her and for you and your siblings that she was able to feel that too, that she was able to express that. And if she wasn't, I hope you're going to be able to get to that on her behalf 
that you'll be right. able to do that. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and I th and I think that that our you know what I can bring and what any artist can bring at any level of technical ability because that's really important to me and mm -hmm. we can we can bring it as, as part of art is to bring that from any part of our past and and let it resonate within us yes now whether we want to put that on stage like I'm not going to sit on stage and play on my baby for half an hour but I I'm sensing that if I do that that those three things you said you know court the sadness make a space for it feeling it get that book so i know how to do compassion <laughs> and then claim or reclaim claim what actually did right. happen that um that that's something that anyone can do yes yes because you can find on it like on a piano or a harp or any instrument even even in your kitchen on a pot you can find a sound that you love and a rhythm and something that you want to play and you can play with it and drums i mean i'm thinking i have a drum sitting over in front of me this morning and you know drums are wonderful for expressing and the drum is the instrument of the heart you know it's the uh -huh. heart the drum beat, right? The drum beat, and I know you sometimes do the drum on on your heart. Oh, on the heart, yeah. right? And the rhythm, yeah. yeah the, and even, yeah, um, yeah. So, uh, you know, there are all kinds of ways, I, and I think part of it is just giving ourselves the permission that it sh and letting go of any should and just expressing, just mm -hmm. experimenting. And again, your soundscapes is a great encouragement to do that in your, in this particular. Because it gives, it, it gives some support in the background. Yeah. And, and I would say to anybody doing this, and I say this in, in, in the class, that you also <clears throat> need to make a safe space for this. Yes. But the last thing you need to do is to have someone hear you do this, who is going to come in and say, I think that knows a little out of tune. Right, right. Yeah, you don't so, want that. <laughs> right. So there's a certain taking of responsibility for ourselves. Um, and this is actually talking, I mean, we're, we've actually shifted into the next string, which is the string of practice, which we're going to talk about next. Yes. Uh, next week. But um, is there any sort of last thing that you want to bring back to talking about roles? Um, just maybe maybe one last thing about the role of leadership and followership and the circular role that when we want to be in leadership we actually need to be following something within ourselves you that's it you said it beautifully that the greatest and most effective leaders are the leaders who are leading from following their own heart and soul's guidance I remember years ago saying to my, after, after I was out of college, meeting with my college um, conductor and saying to him, Michael, how did you, how could you, how did you deal with the fact that we, we were a bunch of punks and we were mad and we came to rehearsal late and we, you know, wouldn't do what you said. And he said, and, and, and that we sometimes hated you. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I wasn't thinking about that. He said, I was there to follow the music uh -huh. and then to give it to you. And that's, I didn't, you could have done anything. I was following something else. Yeah, he was following his heart's passion. Right, and then offering that to us, whatever we did. How many times we rolled our eyes. That's right. So that would be something that we can leave with people. So what would you, I would like to leave with any harpist and any, but no, I would like to leave with any person, every person, to find a sound that you can make and that you love mm -hmm. and to sit with it and to experience a sadness or a happiness or whatever it is, but to get, start learning how to let that bring out your feelings. Yeah. You can feel them. And, yeah. and what would you say, Kathleen, that you would like pe to leave people with? And I wanna leave you with really practicing and cultivating compassion or loving kindness with whatever goes on in your nature. And making a place to be with it doesn't mean you have to act it out. Oh, tell just say a little bit more about that. <laughs> well, so, sometimes people are afraid to make room for the quote negative feelings or the negative destructive impulses out of a fear they're going to act it out and hurt themselves or someone else. 
So I just want to say by being, being present with all of what's in you, that doesn't mean you're going to act it out. In fact, when we can consciously be present and, and connect with this, the life force in it, then we have a choice about whether to act it out or not. Okay, so that's when we have compassion, when right. we're having compassion right. we it together, and then being able to claim that the the beauty right. rather than focusing on. I mean, when we've when we've actually had compassion for the pain, then we can also open up to the the we can claim what what the other side of that. Exactly, we can open up to the creative possibilities, just like you're doing with this friend that you got triggered right, with. Right. He's doing with you. Right. That, you know, you all could have used this as an opportunity to cut off and end the relationship. Right. But you're not. That's you're true. looking at, okay, what's this saying to me? What's here for come into consciousness for me to gain greater access to my own creative life force? And right. now how do we move together knowing this is part of the lay of the land between us? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, Kathleen, yeah. thank you. Um, I'm just really, I am loving these conversations. Yeah. Everything that it's opening up. And I love that this conversation started in your car. Yes. And, <laughs> and just saying, I would like to follow this up. And, and I just love that we're doing it. I do too. Great. And I look forward to seeing you next week. All right. See you next week. All right. Bye. Bye.